It's time now for the Sports Objective Podcast. No talking heads, just guys who love sports. Here's Dave Richmond. Welcome into the Sports Objective Podcast. Great to be with you here this week and had to get my buddy, my brother from a different mother, Kyle from LaGrange Barber. What's up, man? What's going on, Dave? And my other brother from a different mother, <laughs> that would be Bubba Rosenbaum. Man, it feels like it's been forever since we've uh, had a podcast. Yeah, good evening, guys. Um, good to catch up. And uh, so I, the last couple days have, have been a scorcher. Uh, but uh, today it was more like fall here, in, at least in the western part of the state. Yeah, it wasn't yeah, as bad today. Yeah, it was cooler today. I wouldn't say it was like fall down east. But it was, it was certainly nicer than uh, it has been. And it feels, uh, the, speaking of which, it's only what, 50, as we're recording this podcast, is it 52 days of, close to it now? I think 52 days before kickoff, um, something like that for the Pirates and the Wolfpack. I think that's right. I know it's 50. By the time people hear this, I think it's going to be 52 days. So I'm trying to get my head <laughs> on that. And um, it's it's very exciting. I know Bubba, um, our great athletic director, John Gilbert, put out another from the helm. Uh, do, do you want to give some highlights of that? Yeah, um, John Gilbert started that letter from the helm off, uh, just basically thanking Pirate Nation for everything they've done to welcome he and his family to Greenville and make the first seven-plus months on the job a success. And uh, he said he's really enjoying the time. And um, I just talked about um, the importance of communication and, and how um, how they're always there. Uh, if, if you have concerns, uh, ideas, what have you, uh, please reach out. Please reach out to them, and they would certainly always have an open door. And he obviously can't promise uh, immediate uh, answers or immediate uh, reconciliation of problems or what uh, what not. But um, they would certainly uh, listen and do everything they can to uh, come to common ground or, or whatever the situation may be. i tell you what, uh, we we were talking about this, uh, I know Bubba and I were off here, but it literally is like the storms of life, you know, you have those different things and on the pirate ship and uh, things have felt so much better in 2019. It, it seems, you know what's funny, Kyle, when you and I were at that, I know I say it a lot, <laughs> but we're at that IHOP and we're eating pancakes the second episode we ever did on this on this podcast about comfort getting the buyout or leaving whatever uh, things have come. Uh, I mean, what a, dra- a dramatic improvement over the last uh, gosh a year and a half or so we've been doing the podcast, yeah. and it's hard to believe how things are. But it's it, I always tell people this: you always hear that term. You're only as good as the weakest link. I always say you're only as good as the top, and you look at the top with John Gilbert and. It's funny because there were some people that uh, didn't know a lot about him. There were people that um, said, hey, we heard our friends at Southern Miss that said, you know, this, that, and the other. And then so far, so good. And and, and I think you've alluded to it too, Kyle, um, before. It can't, can it be worse <laughs> with the administration? It'd be hard. It'd be hard. <laughs> uh, we had no communication from the previous administration. And uh, so far, so good with Gilbert. Uh you know, he, he, he hasn't done anything to wow. Let me, let me say this right. He, he hasn't had that wow moment yet, uh, but he's done nothing to, 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 to make you go, what the F either. Everything's been solid. Everything's been, been good. He seems very honest, very, um, very real. Uh, he doesn't seem to be, you know, uh, there's nothing fake about him. He he's not a raw raw guy, which is one of the things we were told from the beginning by uh, by uh, some people at USM. He's not. That's not him. But he's very and that's really, okay. Yeah, exactly. Because he comes across as real and genuine. He 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 he's done a good job communicating, which is something that we were told by people at USM is not a strong suit, and it may not have been at USM. Sometimes you learn from your mistakes. Not being good at communicating it is not a there's two there's two kinds of that. There's the Jeff Comer who just didn't care unless you were rich, and then there's people that are just kind of introverted. And, and yeah. I think that's more Gilbert, and uh, he's done a good job. Um, he's not on social media, which I'm kind of surprised at this point nobody's called him into getting a Twitter. Um, 
But uh, well, you don't. Become, you're not on Twitter, sir. <laughs> well, I am on Twitter. I just don't use it. I, I'm, right, yeah. I'm very involved on Facebook. Um, but well, that. That's one of the things, though, Kyle, sorry to interrupt you, but as far as the social media aspect of things, no, he is not, and uh, neither is Joe Dooley. Um, but um, obviously ECU Athletics has a huge presence on Twitter, and then also um, ECU Basketball has a much more enhanced presence on social media since Joe Dooley's arrival. So even though even though those individuals aren't, um, they're – the athletics program as a whole, and then yeah. the, the men's basketball program certainly are, and that's something I've been impressed with. And Gilbert's doing a good job communicating information with those letters from the helm, very reminiscent of Terry Holland's letter from the desk. Yep. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good idea. He, he's, doing, he's doing a good job. Um, so, and I like the little things he, he's doing. Uh, he, he's working hand-in-hand hand with, uh, with Houston. On, on improving our facilities, you know, taking care of little things, man. There's little things that you can do that make a big difference, like the graphics, things like that, that, that Houston is noticing needs to be done, and Gilbert is making sure it happens. Something else about this uh, letter from the helm, uh, one of uh, John Gilbert's big words was alignment, uh, talking about everybody pulling or rowing in the same direction, uh, everybody being on the ship. Um, and so forth. Um, whether it's whether it's Pirate Nation, the athletic department, um, the university as a whole, he he referenced um, interim chancellor Dan Gerlach and and really talked about how impressed he's been with him and enjoyed working with him. So um, those are some of the things that really stood out. And then he moves into talking about um, some of the things that are going to be on the horizon here in mid August. Uh, with the Meet the Pirates event uh, that's going to be held. Um, that's going to be a four-hour event. Uh, you, you have uh, the autograph signings and uh, be it posters or other paraphernalia. Uh, I believe it's at 6 p.m., but from 4 to 6, I guess in Menji's or maybe the Smith-Williams Center, you're going to have the um, always – anticipated uh, equipment sale that was postponed from this spring due to a, due to a lack of inventory. That's, that's cool. Um, have, has there been, and this is a good question for, uh, for John tomorrow as we, uh, as we're recording this on, uh, on Tuesday night, we'll be interviewing uh, coach, coach athletic director, John Gilbert on Wednesday. Um, it'd be a good question for him tomorrow. Will, will there be any uniform changes? That's a good question, and uh, you know, with one of the great things, I think, Kelly, you bring up a good point. When things are bad, you don't care about uniforms as far as to the level of now, when you're starting to see some bright spots, then the little intricacies, the part of the game, so to speak, when you think about football and you think about basketball, baseball, whatever the sport is, you're like curious about little things like this matter now, right? They matter all the time, but you know what I'm saying? Like now things are headed in the right direction. You have the right leadership. We can honestly right now when we go to bed tonight, we can sleep well knowing that the leadership and the coaches and staffs and things just seem like now, I mean, we went from literally, I don't, I hope to God, I'll say this, I hope to God that things don't get worse than 2017. I'll just say that, 2016, 17, I mean, if that is the case, oh, my God. But anyway, um, we know there's ebbs and flows. I think that's probably the deepest valley I've ever been a part of in Pirate Nation. But and uh, anyway, I think I'm appreciating the one thing I will say. I told you guys before, I'm definitely a bigger fan and a better fan when it comes to the different sports and keeping up with the finances. And even though I don't know all the – ins and outs of the budgets and stuff like that. There's some guys and men and women that are better than that than I am. But at least I'm paying attention. Before, I, did, I could care less. I didn't pay attention to things like that. And so I can say for Comfort, um, he definitely may be a better fan as far as being a watchdog. And uh, I think we got so spoiled, Kyle and Bubba, with uh, during the years where we're winning all the time that you kind of you get, I hate the term, but fat, dumb, and happy. You complacent. Um yeah, I yeah no, and, and I've always kind of kept up what was going on behind the scenes with the world of the athletic directors and such. Um, 
And, you know, I don't want to dwell on this. This is all over the bridge now. But when we hired Comfer, I I knew it was the wrong decision. The time I heard him, well, first of all, I wanted to carry Holland out of here was the wrong decision. But the time I heard Holland, excuse me, the time I heard Comfer open his mouth and utter the first few words in his press conference, I said, this is the bad, bad, this is a bad, bad fit. It ain't going to work. Well, it's good to, it's good to, uh, that we're over, you know, uh, thank God that era <laughs> in Pirate Act, athletics is over. Uh, what a nightmare, a horror movie <laughs> for sure. And now the, the sunshine is out every day. Uh, I think that sure we're going to, we're going to have challenges, um, uh, but not the, not the, that's the thing that's great about this. It's not the challenges that, you know, Kyle, when you were talking about, there's things that the three guys on this podcast would do if we were an administration. We're not. We're not trying to be the athletic administration. But hypothetically, if we worked at ECU, it's the little things like your parents say, you know, like being when you see John Gilbert and you see Ryan Robinson, a lot of the uh, staff there, um, they're, they're out working the crowd. They're talking to people. You think about Philip Wood and everybody at the Pirate Club, Matt Maloney, I could go on and on and on, Austin Collard, all the people I know there. Um, they actually do a nice job of mingling, talking to people. And under, in my experience uh, in the Comfort Administration, have we had Philip Wood stuff, on the podcast yet? What's that? We had Philip Wood on the podcast. Yes, he's yes. coming on with me. We're, ha- we're actually having him tomorrow as well. Oh, well, we're, okay, great, great, okay, great. <laughs> Somehow I missed that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the uh, the point of the matter is the, these guys are – and ladies are getting it. How about the fact that, um, you know, I hate that term, training table. We have a nutritionist hired. We're going to have her on soon, uh, Christina Parrish. That's going to be awesome to have her on and awesome to have her. And something we, you know, things like that when I was talking about following the program, just when you think you follow the program close, you start doing a podcast and you follow it closer and closer and closer and I just uh, assumed we already had one. I really did. I didn't know that we didn't. And then the uh, big question for me, guys, uh, get your thoughts and we'll get to our first guest. But um, being the football season is the way, I loved how Mike Houston, nobody says no to Mike Houston. And I think that he's the perfect coach, the perfect time. And the reason I brought that up is I believe that we're going to have tremendous success. And because we're going to have tremendous success, speaking of Philip Wood, now is the time to go ahead and start planning for an indoor practice facility. That is job number one. I know that there. We'll talk to him about the Town Bank Tower, how that's doing, how that's shaping up. It should be this month. They're going to, uh, I think, be finished. We'll see about that. It's supposed to be July, so we'll talk to him about that. But the indoor practice facility is something huge for me. Yeah, it's something we need. It's something that's a necessity to keep up with the Joneses, if you will, on recruiting and such. And not only to keep up with them in recruiting, but just, you know, being able to practice, you know, when, when there's lightning in the area. Uh, you know, sometimes you do want to practice in the rain because you're going to play in the rain. But you also want the opportunity. You, you don't want installation days to be in the rain. And so, you know, it would be great to have the opportunity on that kind of stuff to go inside and practice. And with the lightning delays, you know, it's, I think the same rules apply for practice with lightning as, as they do in games. You know, you, you know how that is. If it, there's lightning in the area, you got to get off the field. So, you know, practice field is desperately needed. Speaking of facilities, Kyle, and that's something else that John Gilbert touched on in his letter from the helm. He talked about how Height Field is coming along nicely with the new oh, field, ter- nice. field oh, turf yeah. field with the Pirate State of Mind at the 50-yard line, uh, which is something that uh, we've talked about, um, hoping that they would do that. But then also um, I know John Gilbert and Ryan Robinson have talked about how we need to get our logos out there, uh, w- w- be it uh, large logos like that or um, just – logos or around our facilities be it on trash cans or whatever uh, but but in addition to that uh, he talked about how the auxiliary field turf field is uh, is still a work in progress of course and um, you also have the um, taking a look at the white lot there behind the town bank tower uh, if you went to the baseball regional here uh, a month ago uh, you probably noticed that that lot was still 
pretty much all grass. Uh, so um, that's something that I was confused or concerned about because I knew the plan was to have it paved and then have the, the actual parking spots grass. So that way um, the majority of the lot where you're going in and out uh, would not be muddy in the way it had been in the past. And and so that does appear, uh, he did say that, that he would um, – or that they were going to see to it that that was paid for the football season, which was good to hear. Uh, he also talked about uh, how there will be a tour of the towers on that August 17th date uh, of Meet the Pirates, which will be fun, allowing all of Pirate Nation, even if you're not sitting in Town Bank Towers as part of uh, the suites or loge boxes, what have you. Um, so that that's good for everyone to see that facility. And then um, he also said, uh, lastly, uh, but the the court uh, inside Minji's, we've heard about its um, redesign. So that's something that's actually beginning this week that we can discuss with Coach Dooley when we have him on in the next day or two. So um, that's a little bit of uh, what he touched on. Well, I'll tell you what, guys. Uh, one thing that I will tell you that I'm going to talk to Gilbert about and uh, I'll, I'll give folks that obviously listen to our podcast on a regular basis. Um, I know Kyle and I have talked about the size of the seats, but I'll tell you, the, even that, that's a huge one. And Benji's, yes. Yeah, yes. And the other one is, for me, the sight lines are terrible. Now, with the seats that I have my, my uh, on the end zones, you're fine. But if you sit on, if you sit in the, there's not really like nosebleeds, nosebleeds, but if you're at the top of the, the arena, you cannot see the. There's no way you know the score. You, where there's vantage points, I've had where some you can, but there's some obviously you can't. And that's one thing that we. I don't know what it's going to take. I've heard all excuses in the world, but we're in the year 2019. We need to have a scoreboard in the middle. They said that the structure couldn't hold it. What do we have to do to get a, a nice scoreboard so everybody in the arena? can see that. And I think that the, you know, they want to reduce the seating a little bit. I have no problems with that. But uh, to me, just as big as that is the issue with the sight lines. Yeah. Um, and you were talking about the sides of the arena. That's what, that's what my dad and I, that's what we move around. Unfortunately, we've had that opportunity due to our, <laughs> uh, due to our lack of attendance. Um, but yeah. our season tickets are on the, the end of the court, um, away from. You're near me. That, yeah. Well, you, actually, uh, that was because I was sitting with, with, uh, Barry Kearney, but, uh, oh, okay. I, actually our tickets are on the opposite end away from Dowdy Ficklin. But, um, but yeah, like you say, uh, I, I've walked up to the top couple rows of, of the, the end of the arena and, and you cannot see the scoreboard and you have no idea. Uh, what's going on? It's it's ridiculous. I, I don't go to enough basketball games to comment on that, but I can tell you the seats are just god awful, and that's one reason why I don't go to very many basketball games. As a big guy, it is it is very uncomfortable. Well, they should. I, I certainly well, understand should your pain there, Kyle, because being six three, um, that's what I kind of yeah. have to sit sideways as well. I, I feel like I'm lady six three. So what are you weighing in today, Bubba? Well, <laughs> I'm talking about from, I'm talking about from the length perspective. I, I oh, am weighing, now you I, want to talk about length? <laughs> we haven't talked about girls yet. Well, you, you brought it up. You brought it up, so I figured yeah, this is a family. I podcast. brought it up. Well, no. yes. You asked me what I was weighing in at, so I, I'm I'm weighing in at 196, Kyle. Six wow, 193. three, 196 of twisted steel and sex appeal. Absolutely, absolutely. Stacy could have told you that. Yeah. Say what now? Nothing. I was picking. I said Stacy could have told you that. All right. Anyway, moving right along. She she could have expressed that and her love of podcast to you in the same sentence. I guarantee it would have happened. (laughs) You guys, she loves our podcast. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Call me back when you're when we're rich and famous, right? Um. (laughs) Anyway, so Bubba, I know let's uh we got time to in between the guests we can talk more. Do you want to go to our first guest? Yeah, we had the opportunity to catch up with Chris Vanini. Uh, we talked to him prior to last season. He's a writer for the Athletic 
uh, and does a tremendous job. And we had the opportunity to talk to him about the Pirates, of course, but then also the rest of the group of five. And let's go to that right now. Well, I get very excited with football season less than a couple months away. Hard to believe it's right around the corner. And another great uh, guest as we preview the group of five, right? Yeah, we enjoyed catching up with this guy last season. I'm very excited to have Chris Benini from The Athletic back. Chris, welcome in. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, I guess we could start at home, Chris, obviously with the American and uh, with the Pirates. Uh, look, things are looking a lot better this season, going into the season versus the last three seasons for the Pirates. And out of the gate, I want to get your thoughts on what you think about uh, being that you cover this for the the Athletic. How do you feel about the Pirates starting out? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, Mike Houston brings a, a good track record with him everywhere he's been. I think ECU, you know, couldn't have hired a more accomplished guy for that job. And, and uh, you know, he's got a quarterback there set and holding theirs. And, and the problem is it's a very difficult conference. It's a very difficult division. And uh, I think ECU will probably be improved on last year. It might take a few years for, for, for Mike to get things going. But when you have to battle, you know, UCF, Cincinnati, USF Temple every year, uh, it's going to be a tough, uh, a tough road back, but uh, I, I think there's plenty of reasons to be optimistic about the future for ECU. And you know, Bubba, with uh, covering the team like we do, the uh, the recruiting press has been unbelievable as over the weekend we get a great kid out of uh, Myrtle Beach and Mason Garcia, one of the best quarterbacks in the 2020 class. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, big pickup there with Mason Garcia and um uh, we certainly expect big things out of Mike Houston, like and like Chris is saying. Uh, you, you definitely don't know uh, that it's going to show up in the, the win column um, and that it's going to show up in the standings because and taking a look at how established some of the programs in the East are, like right. UCF and Cincinnati, the Pirates could be significantly improved and still not finish higher than fourth, but um, especially depending on uh, what Rod Carey is able to do in year one at Temple. Um, so kind of transitioning to the bigger picture of the American, um, let's talk a little bit about, Chris, how do you see things playing out in recent years? It's obviously been UCF, and then Memphis has been right there kind of nipping on their heels. Yeah, well, I mean, starting in the East, there, I, I think to be real interesting, UCF and Cincinnati, I, I think, are the two that will battle it out for the division. UCF uh, brings a ton back again. I mean, they've been the class of the league the last few years. They've got a, a ton of skilled players still across the board. Biggest problem is that Mackenzie Milton is obviously uh, not playing this year after that that nasty knee injury from a year ago. So they've got a quarterback battle going on with Brandon Wimbush, the Notre Dame transfer, and uh, Daryl Mack, who took over last year. So uh, I, I think I think I would probably still pick UCF just because of of the depth of, of talent and what we've seen from them before. But Cincinnati, I mean, coming out of nowhere to win 11 games last year, they bring just about everybody back, and they, they could be a preseason top 25 team as well, uh, Cincinnati there. And I, something I'm keeping my eye on, actually, with Cincinnati is uh, in, in, it might be week two or, or three, one of those early weeks, Cincinnati plays at Ohio State. And, you know, Ohio State has a, a bit of turnover. They've got a new quarterback. Ohio State hasn't lost to an in-state opponent in – decades. So I, I, I'm low-key kind of looking to see if Cincinnati can maybe pull an upset there. Uh, but but Luke Fickle should build on what he got there. And, and then in the, the West, I think it comes down to Houston or Memphis. Memphis seems to have the more complete team. Houston's got the new coach with Dana Holgerson, but a ton of holes on defense from a defense that was really bad last year. So I think Memphis is probably the favorite to come out of that. And if that's the case, it'd be three straight years of, of UCF Memphis in the conference championship game. But uh, uh, it's going to be an uh, interesting race, especially in the East. Uh, no taking a look, yeah, Dave, um, before we moved on, that's what I was just going to say a couple things that came to mind. Uh, talking about Cincinnati, I'm trying to remember uh, which which one of the um, publications or five dimes maybe it was that they had their over-under on win totals, and I was very surprised to see Cincinnati coming off the year they had last year and everything they returned to be at five and a half. I was wondering if something seemed uh, – it seemed like something must be going on there to uh, to have five and a half. That seemed like sh- uh, sure money, and you know how that goes. But uh, and then in the West, um, Tulane and Willie Fritz. Do you think there's someone that could uh, potentially factor into things? 
Yeah, no, they they finally got over the hump to to sneak into a bowl game last year, and they've they finally got a quarterback set. Uh, but they're also kind of tweaking the offense. They brought in Will Hall from Memphis to be the new offensive coordinator. So I'm curious to see what the new uh, offense is going to look like there. But uh, I, I think he, I think Willie Taggart might or I'm sorry, Willie Fritz might have just gotten another extension there. So they seem to have some. Solid stuff in place. They got the quarterback from LSU who took over uh, and, and finished the year with a strong game against Louisiana Lafayette in the bowl game. Um, so I, I think Tulane could probably be improved. I, I, I wouldn't. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to pick him to win the division. Although I guess technically they did tie for the division title last year with everybody at five and three. But I, I think Memphis is going to be quite a bit improved, even though they lose Daryl Henderson and, and Tony Pollard. On offense, they they still have a lot of talented offensive guys. Or the quarterback is going to be more experienced, and the defense for Memphis should take a big step up after last year's defense was was loaded with a bunch of sophomores. Um, and then Houston, I think, is going to put up a ton of points as well in that division. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, Chris, as far as uh, moving to another conference, uh, looking at Conference USA, who do you like there and and those uh, not great conference. Yeah, in the East, I, I, I think my pick is it comes down to either Marshall or FIU. Um, FIU has quietly done a really good job in the two years under Butch Davis. They, they won nine games last year, school record for wins, for a program that had been one of the worst in the country ever since it had basically been started. Um, but they, they've got a, a solid quarterback in Alex Morgan and, and a lot of returning talent across the board. And then Marshall is always solid. Uh, they, they they won nine games last year. They should be in the mix again as well. Uh, in the West, it's it's probably North Texas's division to lose. Mason Fine is back at quarterback. South Latrell uh, stayed as the head coach. Mason Fine will be one of the best quarterbacks in the country. Uh, they got to patch up a couple holes, but I, I, I think I think they have to be considered the favorite right now. U, UAB won that division last year, won eleven games, but they lost like thirty five players because last year's team was loaded with JUCO seniors. Um, so they have a lot to replace. I think there's a lot of potential there, but I kind of got to see it first from UAB. And then Louisiana Tech should be solid. Southern Miss should be solid. Uh, but I, I think considering who they'll have at quarterback, I think North Texas is the favorite in the West. Yeah, Seth Luttrell at UNT, they really seem to be like one of the – he really seems to be one of those up-and-comers, and it'll be interesting to see how much longer he is out there in Denton, Texas. Yeah, he was up for the Kansas State job. Um, sounded like he decided against it, but I expect another big year for North Texas. I expect Seth Luttrell to get a lot of Power Five interest. He did lose his offensive coordinator, Graham Harrell, who actually actually turned down the OC job at North Carolina to stay. But then USC came calling when Cliff Kingsbury left. So uh, there'll be a new offensive coordinator at North Texas. Although Luttrell is heavily involved in that, on that side of the ball. Uh, it definitely kind of, seems like Chris. I was going to mention that a lot of these coaches are waiting for that right job instead of taking a job which may be more difficult in the Power Five. Some of the schools that may be more basketball schools, they're struggling and they keep turning over. Coaches seem to be smarter making the right move instead of just moving to a Power Five school. Yeah, it depends where you are and what you have. I, I mean, if, if you're at a school that hasn't had if you're at a group of five schools that doesn't have a history of success, if, if you're losing your top players, maybe you want to get out. But Latrell, he he knew he was coming back to one of the best quarterbacks in the country when Mason Fine. He was coming back to a program that is getting a good amount of financial support, um, a, a program that should a, a, a indoor practice facility that is getting built there. I, I think he's you know he was in a position where he didn't need to immediately jump at the first job that 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 came up. Um, other guys might be in different positions, but you know, every, everybody's everybody's got money these days. Everybody's got uh, good to decent facilities. Every, you know, it's, it's it's not maybe the same as as it used to be even ten years ago, where uh, uh, you had to jump at the first thing that that came to you. What about uh, talking about uh, conferences? What about the the MAC? I know that's one Bubba and I have been t- keeping our close eye on with Jim McElwain. Uh, there, Chris Creighton, uh, two of the good coaches there in the league. What do you think about the MAC? Yeah, I think the West division in the MAC is going to be really, really interesting. Northern Illinois is always one of the best teams, but 
Eastern Michigan with Chris Creighton, they bring a ton back. They, they, they should contend for the division. Toledo's always up there. Uh, Western Michigan should be there again. I, I have them as a possible dark horse New Year Six candidate potentially because uh, they, they've had good starts the last two seasons and then, and then the quarterback, Josh, uh, John Wasink got hurt and was out for the year and both of those seasons fell off. If he stays healthy, they've got the most experienced team in the country in terms of seniors and, and veteran players uh, that um, th- 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 they have a mix as well. It's going to be a tough climb back for Jim McElwain at Central Michigan there in a division with a bunch of good teams. In the other division, it's kind of up in the air. Uh, Buffalo lost a ton off of last year's team after they won the division. Ohio is probably the favorite to win the division. Frank Solich is still there, still winning eight, nine games a year. Nathan Rourke is a really good quarterback. Uh, so it's probably between those two teams and the other division. So uh, it could be a year of solid depth in the MAC. As far as the MAC's concerned, uh, like Dave was saying a moment ago, uh, Chris, that's what with um, Chris Creighton at Eastern Michigan – but then also Lance Leipold at uh, Buffalo. Um, yeah. It's going to be interesting to see if that becomes a trend in college football um, guys or programs, rather, and universities not steering away from hiring coaches from lower levels. I mean, guys that had had just remarkable success at the Division three level and how that translated to um, their group of five schools. And so do you think that's something that we could see more of here in the years to come? Yeah, I mean, Akron – they hired um, their coach from Chattanooga. He only spent one year there. He was previously the head coach at uh, John Carroll University, at D, I think it's D3 school in uh, Ohio. So I, I think um, for certain schools, having head coaching experience uh, can show you move on. I mean, even Mike Houston, I mean, he's coached at different levels. He was at FCS before there, but he's he's been at D2 and other stuff like that. So, uh Guys, there's different paths different guys can take. I mean, uh, Dave Clawson at Wake Forest slowly moved from head coaching job to head coaching job, slowly moving his way up. Uh, was at, I think, Richmond, Bowling Green, Wake Forest. So there's there's different ways that, that guys can go. And I think if you're winning at that level, uh, guys are going to get looks. Chris, I wanted to ask you across the board um... – and then we'll get the Sun Bowl. But is there a, a um, as far as a group of five, are there teams that you're going to see the most improved and ones that are kind of kind of backslide this year? Most improved. I'm very curious about USF. Uh, they started the year seven and zero and reached the top of one five, and then they lose their final six games of the year and, and kind of a mess. A bunch of kids got kicked off the team, and Charlie Strong overhauled his staff. But going into this year, they've got a, a solid veteran team. Blake Barnett, former Alabama, former Arizona State quarterback, is solid. If he can stay healthy, that will be big. Uh, they brought in Kerwin Bell, the, who was the head coach at D2 Valdosta State, to, to run kind of the kind of like the fun and gun Steve Spurrier offense. Because uh, Charlie Strong's going to be facing some pressure, I think, to win this year after the after finishing last year 0 and six. Uh, the schedule kind of sets – I think they open against Wisconsin, which should be a really interesting matchup, but their schedule is kind of similar to last year where all the really tough opponents are all in those final, like, four weeks. So it's possible we could see another regular season collapse from them again, but if not, might be a team to actually keep an eye on in the East Division of the American if, uh, if UCF's quarterback situation doesn't get itself figured out. Moving on to the Sun Belt, um, when you start um, and start off talking about the Sun Belt, excuse me, you have to start, of course, up in Boone, North Carolina with App State. That program has been such a model of success over the last several years um, under Scott Satterfield. He, of course, moved on to Louisville. Now you have NC State offense coordinator who also has Arkansas State, um, some Gus Malzahn roots um, from, from Auburn, and then also spent some time, I think it was one season, at Boise State. So um, talk a little bit about um, the Mountaineers and then also who else do you expect to be contending with them in the Sun Belt? Yeah, I mean, App State, new coach, Eli Drinkwitz, he, he he takes over a team that's absolutely loaded. Quarterback, running back, wide receiver, defense, this team is, is pretty stacked from top to bottom, and I think they'll probably be the favorite in the Sun Belt again. Troy has to 
has to fix a few more holes than, than App State does. Both obviously have a new coach, as you said. Um, but another team, Georgia Southern kind of came out of nowhere to win 10 games last year, and, and they seem to be heading on, on the right track back to what those fans are, are used to seeing. So I'm, I'm very curious if they can continue that momentum. Uh, they, they, they fired the, two years ago, midway through the season, they fired the coach. They hire the, they end up hiring the interim guy as the permanent head coach. And then he goes on a great run last year. So see if the momentum continues there. And then in the West, Arkansas State has to replace a few things, got a, a new quarterback. Um, but, but they're always very solid. Blake Anderson has a completely new staff. He had to, he's had to replace almost everybody on that staff, which will be an interesting transition. And then, yeah. And then Louisiana Lafayette, Billy Napier's team, kind of a surprise division champion last year and, and reached a bowl game in, in the conference championship game. So they seem to be heading in the right track. And same with Louisiana Monroe. They went 6-6 six and six but didn't get to a bowl game. They should have a really high-powered offense uh, again, with um, which we expected last year. It didn't really happen, but uh, should get back on track on offense and could be another solid team. You know, Chris, it's funny when you talk about that situation at Georgia Southern. It's funny sometimes how the how – the, how the pieces, the way they can uh, come together. Uh, you have a guy that was there on staff, and then, um, and then, like you said, Georgia Southern ends up hiring the guy as the the permanent head coach, and then he wins ten games. Uh, kind of reminds you a little bit of uh, Tommy Bowden uh, when that went down with with him and uh, Dabo Sweeney there at Clemson several years ago. Yeah, yeah, it is, and and I I, I did a story on this last year about. Uh, interim coaches who end up getting the job and Lunsford was one and, and um, uh, down at Ole Miss another. And I, I talked to Dabo about it. And Lunsford, I, I, I believe Chad Lunsford, the coach at Georgia Southern, I believe he talked to Dabo. A lot of these guys, a lot of coaches when they get fired or, or a lot of coaches when they take over as an interim job during the season, a lot of them will reach out to Dabo to, to talk to him about how he handled it and what he, he went through. Cause he's kind of the standard. A lot of these guys hope to, to follow. And, uh, yeah, it's been a, a down couple of years there at Georgia Southern, a very vocal and proud fan base, um, very much in love with, with the triple option. And they really figured things out last year. They got a solid quarterback, and and, and, and people are expecting big things again. Last but certainly not least, let's move on and talk about the Mountain West um, out there. You always think about Boise State, but um, – here in recent years, you've had Fresno State, the tremendous job that Jeff Tetford's done there with the Bulldogs, his alma mater. And so um, in addition to those two programs, of course, San Diego State has been very consistent. And so how do you see the, the Mountain West shaking out this year? Yeah, it's a bit of a, a reset for a couple of teams. Boise State has to replace its quarterback after Brett Rippon was a multi-year starter. Um, they they Boise's Boise, they're always going to be really good, but they still need to figure out a quarterback. Same thing goes with Fresno State. Uh, Marcus McMarion is gone after two incredible years under under Jed Ted, Jeff Tedford. They need to uh, quarterback situations there. And that, that's why Utah State, I think, is the team to watch here. Jordan Love quietly was one of the best quarterbacks in the country last year as a – I think he was a sophomore. And so he's back at, at Utah State, but they've got a new coaching staff after Matt Wells left for Texas Tech. Gary Anderson is back. Uh, we'll have to see how they adjusted the new staff, but Utah State should have the best quarterback in this league. And, and Nevada was solid last year when eight and five. Talked to Jay Norvell, the head coach. He, he thinks uh, they have a chance to be even better. Hawaii was solid. Cole McDonald is, is set as their quarterback. Um, uh, Nick Rolovich seems to have figured things out. Uh, figured things out again there in, in May. Um, I expect Hawaii to continue to have solid season. And then San Diego State, they need to figure out the running back situation. The, the defense is always solid, but the previous few years, whether it was Rashad Penny or Donald Pumphrey, it was always a power running team with a solid defense to go with that. And the offense was not what it needed to be last year. They go seven and six. Uh, so they'll need to figure that out on offense because defensively, as always, they should be pretty solid. Yeah, that um, the move you referenced with Utah State that was very interesting with Coach Anderson coming back because obviously he had that success he did there before, and then he had moved on to Wisconsin. Uh, his time there was uh, pretty short lived, and then he moved on and didn't have a whole lot of success up in Corvallis. So that was an intriguing move. But I guess 
given the success he had had there at Utah State, it wasn't totally surprising to see them opt to bring him back. Yeah, I, I like. I don't think anybody else in the country would have hired Gary Anderson to be their head coach just because of the way he left his previous two jobs, leaving Wisconsin for Oregon State after two or three years, something like that, and then basically quitting on Oregon State midway through the season. Um, Utah State wanted, or at least certain people at Utah State wanted him because of the success he had previously. And, and before before him, there had not been a lot of success there for a long time, so certain boosters and people wanted to uh, go with what they maybe considered a, a, a safe, proven pick, and, and that's the guy they ended up going with. And Chris, I have a question for you. Looking at the group of five at large, and this question is actually from one of our other co-hosts, Kyle Barber. Um, he was unable to join us today, obviously, but uh, Kyle wanted me to ask, um, when you take a look at the group of five at large, uh, how far ahead of the other group of five conferences do you think the American is? I, I think it's a, a good step ahead. I, I think it's in a middle tier right now between – the rest of the G5 and the Power 5, it's not – I know they try to push the Power 6, and I get it, and I think it's been a valuable thing that they've done. Um, but it's not a Power 6. They don't have an automatic birth to the New Year's 6 uh, bowl, and then until they do, they, they won't be. Now, the American more years than not is getting that bid, and if they continue to do so, that'll help that. But uh, whether it's TV money from that new TV deal, which is – far and away higher than the rest of the G5, whether it's the, the money they're paying the coaches, the, the money they're putting into facilities, in, a lot, in some cases the, the, the quality of the schools or the size of the schools, being in so many metropolitan areas for, for, uh, for some of the other schools. Uh, it, it, it's pretty clearly, I think, in that middle tier. You look at, I mean, you look at Rod Carey. He goes from Northern Illinois to Temple. That's a technically a G5 moved a G5 head coaching job to a G5 head coaching job. But he viewed Temple clearly as a step ahead of Northern Illinois, which is the best program in the MAC. So that kind of tells you what it means for the American. They, they hire Ron Hunter, the Georgia State basketball coach at Tulane, uh, another similar G5 to G5 move in basketball. But that, that kind of tells you that, that it is a – considered a step up from the rest of the G5. It's not a power five, but the American has positioned itself very well. Even with UConn leaving, that was more a personal fit as it relates to basketball than anything else. I think the American remains in a very uh, solid position. And the TV deal, I think, reflects that. But Chris, I want to mention, too, the fact that um, one of the things, and it sounds maybe like I'm Homer for the American, a group of five, but I don't like the term group of five or power five. I think we're all division one. I think that football in itself uh, is doing itself a disservice um, where they could be making a lot more money. Uh, um, th for example, the American is doing exactly the same thing that all the Power 5 schools are doing. And that's the thing that's concerning for me is if we're doing exactly the same things, we should have the same benefits. And that's something that, um, unfortunately, the Power 5 schools, so to speak, don't get that they're short-sighted on the fact that college football could be even more dominant if they would go back to the way we had it before with everybody being on the same umbrella. Well, are you talking like before we even had any sort of BCS and where it was basically everybody's what they are and, and the sports writers vote the national champion? No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about the as far as benefits we give. I mean, East Carolina, for example, we're doing exactly the same thing as Alabama. Now, are we on the same page as far as money? And facilities, no. Um, but as far as doing everything else, we're doing exactly the same thing. And as our co-host Kyle Barber has mentioned, unfortunately, it looks like it's going to come down to lawsuits from the group of schools um, to make that happen where we'll be on the same playing field. Well, I think, it, I mean, the biggest, the biggest divide, the reason we call it what it is currently is because of the playoff contract and that was a contract that all of the leagues agreed to. I mean, the group of five leagues or whatever you want to call them, you know, agreed to that setup. Do, you know, the 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 the, the contract ends in 2026, I want to say. Right. Uh sure. so, you know, once or if they decide to renegotiate it at the halfway point, you know, I know there's the push for expansion. Um a lot of people they, I talked to Michael Kelly the the AD at USF. He used to be the CEO or COO of the playoffs, and he thinks expansion is coming at some point. Whether that's 
soon or whether that's at the end of the contract, who knows? It's probably more likely at the end of that contract. And, you know, if it gets to a spot where uh, you get a playoff and you get a group of five automatic berth to whatever playoff they got, then I think it'll bring more legitimacy to it. Um, but, the, the, the you know, the, the bottom line is it's a group of five power five mix be, simply because of who is eligible for who is automatically eligible for the championship. It was the same thing as BCS and non-BCS uh, before that because I mean, it, it's still a better setup. I mean, beforehand, non-BCS conferences didn't even have a had even had even tougher chance of getting. They had to be what top twelve or something like that. Only a couple of years did, did a team actually get that spot. Now to at least have an automatic New Year's Six spot, it's an improvement over what it was. Now the key will be whatever they do next at whatever point, will there be more inclusion, which I think there should be because I think there's a number of group of five teams that could compete with some of the best in the power five. But uh, this is kind of where things are at right now, and, and it's something that everybody agreed to at the time, and, and uh, so things fly out the way they do. Well, hopefully we can get uh, certainly, like if East Carolina were to go, like I was saying, 12-0, and if they, if they go 12-0, and um, a miracle season, we found out with UCF, for example, they go two years undefeated, and they still couldn't even get in the college playoff, and they beat even uh, really good teams, including Auburn. So I think the biggest thing is there's just a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of politics in football, and maybe one day it'll have the same effect as far as baseball and including basketball, any sport. If you do well and you play in your conference, you win your conference, you're you know in the playoffs. So. I know it's a different animal, and we could debate it for hours. You and I and Bubba didn't come up with the, the system, and um, but anyway, it's just something that's very frustrating if you if you're in the group of five. Yeah, and, and I get that. I, I wrote I wrote a column after you after the playoff came out last year that you know if you wanted to make given who was who was you know available, the fact that that Notre the fact that UCF didn't make it. Um, was understandable. You had what I think three undefe- was it three undefeated teams or two? I don't remember what exactly what it was made it last year's playoff. But compared to the year prior, where UCF was the only undefeated team at the end of the year, um, but the fact that UCF was not even in the conversation was a problem. The fact that they were behind Michigan was a problem, and that was a sign of not uh, not taking seriously UCF. And, and maybe if Mackenzie Milton's healthy, they look at it a little differently. I'm doubtful of that, but I think Mackenzie Milton's injury gave gave some people an easy pass on it. But uh, yeah, I, I think it was ridiculous that they weren't even in the conversation. You know, leading up to in that day, they're talking about it on ESPN. They're comparing a couple of teams for the last spots, and the fact that he's just not even in that conversation, I think, is is the, is indicative of the biggest part of that problem, which was that they weren't even considered. Chris, you've been generous with your time, and uh, we, like I said, we could talk hours about uh, that, and we didn't come up with a system, so hopefully it's a baby step in the right direction. Hopefully it'll be better in the next handful of years. Uh, tell folks, by the way, I want to tell folks that when the first time we had you on, I signed up for The Athletic. I look at it every single day. I'm a huge fan of The Athletic. How can people find your work, and how can they subscribe to The Athletic? Well, I uh, appreciate that. Uh, obviously, theathletic.com is, is where – we have everything. We cover every pro team, a bunch of college teams. I cover a group of five. Uh, no ads. Y- you can get a you can get a subscri- subscription for I think three bucks a month if you go to theathletic.com slash state of the program forty. The number four zero state of the program forty. We're running a long series of twenty nineteen previews, uh, team previews. We're actually coming up on the end of that pretty soon here, uh, but we've had that. I think it's a 30% off, 30 or 40% off deal. And it comes out to about three bucks a month. Uh, no ads. The app is 4.9 star rating. Very easy to read. Uh, type of in-depth quality stuff you're not going to find a lot of other places. And it's on a website that's really easy to navigate and read. And I um, hope you guys will check it out. And I appreciate you signing up. Absolutely. Appreciate your time, man. Hopefully we can have you back on definitely before football season and certainly uh, during football season as well. Sounds good. Take care. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, I know that right there, but I had my 
Kyle was at work when we interviewed him, and I had Indeed. my Kyle moment there. Um, but Kyle, I was talking to him, as you heard there, the the very fact of the Power Five argument and how it's going to take probably suing them. Because my point has always been about the issue of Group of Five and Power Five, which is media-driven anyway by the, the uh, worldwide leader. Uh, it creates an unfair advantage of perception. I mean, right. you, you already have bigger conferences with more money. Why do you need that tag to 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 you know hurt us even more? And who's to say Kansas, for example, has more power in college football than UCF? Who's right. to say Rutgers has more power than Cincinnati? I mean, you know, it's it's it's, it's ridiculous. The reason why it's ridiculous for me is like I was telling him, and the argument you've heard me say, uh, say many times. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I wanted to, coming out of the interview, I like Chris Fanini, and uh, I think he knew that I wasn't anti him. It just drives me crazy. And I brought up the point, and he, he agreed with me. But it drives me crazy when you see a UCF that's won 25 games in a row. Okay, I'm not a UCF fan. Everybody knows that. However, I give them props. They did a great job, had a nice run. They had nice wins in there. And it wasn't like, um, that they're playing like FCS, like twelve games or twenty five games. Oh, I mean, they, they play the final. They play they, some they, big boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the and, American Athletic Conference is a tough yeah. schedule to play. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and then I, I, you know, I would have liked to see how that bowl game with LSU would have turned out had they had the quarterback. Exactly, uh, Mackenzie Milton. It was a, that's the thing that's uh, anyway twenty five and out of two years twenty five and one. Uh, I'll we'll take it. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> And but anyway, my point is my point is to the whole thing is if we're in other words, if we're doing the same things that Alabama is as far as like um, the requirements and all that, which we are, then we should be power five. Period. There are I would like to see this is what I would like to see. I would like to see if we're doing everything the power five, you know, requires or whatever, then we should be power five. If you choose to. Not do like the uh, what is it the um, stipends? The stipends, yeah. If you choose not to do that and things like that, cost of living stipends, whatever. You're yeah, call yeah. Then I can understand why you would be considered group of five, and I have no problem with that. But the problem I have is if we're doing the same things and we're not getting the credit for doing the same things, it seems to me that there's only a handful of schools, of course, that. There's a political pro- thing problem I have there when East Carolina in baseball, basketball, any sport has a miracle season, they have a shot at the national championship. And football, which has had a rich tradition for many, many years, there's even if we if we have a tough schedule, go twelve and zero, I guarantee you they'll find some excuse of of, uh, oh, yeah, well, they're a New York Six Bowl. Well, that's great. And right now, that um, I'm not arguing that that would be <laughs> tremendous right now for our program where it's, been, where it's been the last few years. But I'm talking about big picture. If um, It's just a, to me that it makes no sense when baseball, here we are, the Super Regionals, we're so close to Omaha. And basketball, you have a feeling that in a few years, Dooley's going to get at least to the tournament. And in other words, there's a there's I guess what I'm trying to say the whole thing, and I'm not doing a good job this way tonight. There's a rhyme and reason. <laughs> there's a rhyme and reason to it. You know that if you win your conference and you're in the conference tournament, um, and you win the conference tournament, you go to the national tournament, and if you you know win a handful of games, you win the national championship. Whatever it is, you know. You like somewhere the, along the way here, Dave. What's that? You lost me somewhere along the way here. Okay, I'm just saying that there's a. I'm just saying there's a rhyme or reason. You understand what it takes to win the national championship. Correct, yeah. On football, paper. There's, really not. there's no rhyme or reason. There's no – There's. it's so subjective. It's definitely not objective, um, as we are. <laughs> but they are – that's the problem I have with football. I love the sport. I'm, I'm not anti the sport. Uh, the playoff system's a problem. The playoff system's a problem in the classic A group of five and power five is a bunch of BS. You don't need it. It is not needed. Look, look at basketball. The ACC, still the ACC, the Big Ten, still the Big Ten. You don't need the classification. No, no. Do you want to go to our next guest, Bubba? Speaking of uh, Kyle, we'll love this, uh, our next guest. 
Yeah, prior to last season, we, we had the opportunity to catch up with Greg Rebell, the play-by-play voice of BYU, and we had the opportunity to do so again uh, here earlier today. And uh, let's go to that interview right now with the longtime play-by-play voice of the BYU Cougars, Greg Rebell. Well, Bubba, it's summertime here in the dog days of summer in North Carolina and the eastern part of the country, and uh, we have a good friend now on the western part of the country We want to talk some football. Yeah, Dave, uh, approaching mid-July and very excited now to be joined by the longtime play-by-play voice of the BYU Cougars, Greg Rebell. Greg, welcome into the show. Bubba, pleasure as always. How are you? We're doing well. Yeah. Um, very, very excited to catch up, Greg. Um, really enjoyed chatting with you prior to last season. And uh, talking about the Cougars, as you take a look at this BYU club, um, they're 7-6 and six, uh, a year ago, coming off of a rare losing season in 2017, and it seemed as though uh, it was a step back in the right direction, and I know they returned plenty for uh, the 2019 season. So uh, what's your take on things out there in Provo? Well, you know, last year was a year with a change in offensive coordinators. Uh, they went from Ty Detmer to Jeff Grimes, and I've always felt that uh, no matter what the team, uh, first years with new OCs are kind of crapshoots, and, and, and you just don't know exactly what to expect. And when I mean, you look back on it, you can see reasons why things went the way they were. And, and in Jeff Grimes' first year as OC, I think a winning record was okay because they made a, they made a change midstream. You know, they, they switched starting quarterbacks middle of the season from a senior to a freshman, and, and even with some of those growing pains, uh, the freshman quarterback, Zach Wilson, showed a ton of promise, uh, did get BYU to that winning record, and had a perfect bowl game. He went 18 for 18 in his team's bowl game, and, and again, was, was a great springboard performance heading into his sophomore season. Now, he did have some shoulder surgery in the offseason. That's potentially troubling, so no one's really seen him throw uh, 100% uh, since the last game of last season, and even then he was playing hurt. So let's see what... Uh, what a fixed-up Zach Wilson looks like here in his sophomore year, but he plays behind an offensive line that's more or less intact and, and brings back brings back almost an, uh, every major uh, you know skill player, and then they've even added a couple of grad transfer running backs for depth as well. So I think offensively should be a strength of this BYU team. That's some pretty important spots to fill on defense, including a high draft pick uh, to the NFL. Uh, one of the things is I was glancing over uh, last season's results and so forth um, that really jumped out is um, the way you guys started the season with the with the wins over Pac-12 and Big Ten opponents in Arizona and Wisconsin and also had a near miss against the Cal Bears. And then, like you said, I guess it was, what, game six, you had that quarterback change, and uh, he, re- he really performed adm- admirably, excuse me, down the stretch in the second half of the season. And then uh, with the bowl game, of course, the infamous um, quote by Coach Sataki that really that was really funny um, when he was talking about um, he expected perfection. I guess it was with the ESPN sideline reporter before that Idaho Potato Bowl. And then, uh, sure enough, that's what that's what Wilson delivered. Yeah, 18 for 18, and then Tanner Mangum came in and threw a pass as well. So the team was perfect on the day throwing the football. And and, and you talked about the early wins last year against uh, Arizona and Wisconsin. And, and the Cal game was kind of a hint at kind of the inconsistency we saw from BYU last year. Big win to start the year, then kind of a letdown the next week at home against Cal. Then they go into to, to Camp Randall and, and win a game nobody thought they would win. So it was that kind of year for BYU. And, and uh, you know, and, and, and the microcosm of the inconsistency was the Utah game. Uh, you know, it, it had been forever since BYU had beaten the rivals, and there they were leading 20 to nothing at halftime, uh, leading 27 to 7 late third, and found a way to lose that game. And so, uh, again, kind of an indication of where that team was last year. Let's see if they can smooth out some of those wrinkles and be a tad more consistent uh, this time around. Diving into things a bit deeper on the offensive side of the ball, um, you obviously you referenced quarterback Zach Wilson. Um, talk about some of the skill pieces the Cougars have around Zach. Well, the guy that got the most touches last year is back, and that's a running back, Lopini Katoa. Had a really high uh, touchdown-to-touch rate, uh, one of the best actually BYU's seen, but but no running back last year was actually all that durable or consistent. Uh, no running back played more than 11 games, and of course BYU played 13, and so everybody missed time last year. And, and the hope is by bringing in Tyson Williams out of South Carolina there in the SEC and Emmanuel Asupa out of Rice, 
Uh, these are two good proven backs, fifth-year guys that can give BYU, again, uh, more people to turn to should they face the kind of issues they did last year with injuries. So running back should be okay. I'm not sure how explosive BYU is going to be, but I think Lopini Katoa is a little bit overlooked right now, despite the fact he was the leading touch guy uh, for BYU last year. At wide receiver, Aleva Hifo, Gunnar Romney, uh, Talon Shumway, uh, guys that BYU's seen for a while now, uh, and, and we need to step up. BYU needs to step up from every one of those guys. The real strength is at tight end, and that's where Matt Bushman has led BYU in receptions and receiving yards in back-to-back years. A potential pro in tight end Matt Bushman, 6'5", 240, 245, real good build, and, and some of the best hands that Jeff Grimes has been around, he says, in his entire football career. And, and the offensive line, as I noted, uh, brings back four starters and is expected to be kind of an anchor of this year's team. Take I a want to ask this question. I'm sorry, go ahead, Dave. Uh, Greg, well, one of the questions that I had, it's certainly a man on the street question, with uh, UConn leaving the American in all sports, I just want to ask you, one of the teams mentioned was BYU. Is that something that BYU would entertain coming in with football? Well, uh, Dave, the, the commissioner of the, of the AAC is, is basically said, you know, we'll, we'll talk with anybody who, who is interested. And, and he said to that point, which was a week or so ago, a week and a half ago, he said BYU would not express the interest. And so let's see, uh, you know, what, what, the, what the future looks like if conversations ensue. But I know that BYU is pretty content with its current situation relative to exposure and, and, and finances with the TSPN deal, the ability to schedule whenever and wherever it kind of wants right now around the country. And it's a tough schedule, but it's a fun one if you're a college football player uh, to get to do and see all the things BYU's doing as an independent scheduler. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you know, BYU wants to position itself, uh, you know, for, for, for the most reasonable expectation of success. And right now it's independent. If it stays that way, uh, you know, time will tell. The obvious objective is, is, is P5, but, but no one's really come calling that way. And, and there's probably one more great restructuring still to come, and we'll see what that looks like at that time. And I know that, uh, you know, Commissioner Oresco out of the American Conference believes that his, his league is positioned to be, uh, you know, back to a P6, if you will, and be the sixth of those power six. And, again, that's a, that, that's a discussion point as well. But uh, I know BYU would be attractive for whoever – uh, you know, sought the Cougars out, but right now I think the Cougars feel they're in the best possible situation considering the current landscape. Greg, kind of uh, shifting back to, to football, taking a look at the defensive side of the ball, um, the Cougars there have been um, very strong in recent years. I, I know something like the last seven or eight years they've only allowed more than 25 points per game um, just one time, and then I know – a year ago, they allowed a little over 21 points a game. So talk about the Cougars on that side and uh, and what they have this year. One of the real strengths of BYU, and if you look at last year's numbers uh, as well, you, you, you look at big plays allowed. BYU is one of the best teams in the country at keeping plays in front of them and not allowing big plays to beat them. And, and defense was really the strength of the squad last year. While the freshman quarterback kind of got his feet wet, uh, defense helped to carry the day. Uh, head coach Kalani Satake, although he was an offensive player at BYU, has made his living as a defensive coach. Uh, he and defensive coordinator Elisa Tuiaki, very good friends for a very long time. And so I think BYU kind of carries the identity of those two guys, and that identity is centered on uh, tackles, strong, stout tackles, and, and D-line play in general. The belief is that BYU has to be a disruptive team without bringing a lot of people. Um, you can find all kinds of teams that want to create all kinds of havoc by blitzing like crazy, but that's not really going to be BYU style. Again, they're conservative, generally speaking, in terms of keeping plays in front of them, but they need to be a little more disruptive dis- uh, without having to bring all kinds of players. And so uh, Kalani and Elisa say, if we can have you know pressure from the front four, that's going to tell uh, how good this team can be defensively, but BYU has been, as you noted, pretty darn well, pretty darn good under Coach Sataki uh, defensively in the last two, three years. I had a question for you, Greg. As far as the when uh, with this team, uh, I'm really happy when you guys came to Greenville, and I know that we have a. Uh, uh, I'm very excited to have BYU back on the schedule in years to come. Um, can you talk about? I know you were just talking about it, but triggered a memory about. Uh, the different places this season and maybe in future schedules, games that matchups that you really like? Well, again, it is one of the interesting things about being an independent is you get to kind of put yourself uh, all, you know, all around the country on, on a yearly basis. And it's, it's a double-edged sword because a lot of it is front-loaded, right? You're going to find um, 
you're, you're going to find September's looking a lot like this year's does. And, and BYU is the only team in the country that opens the season with four straight P5s. Home to Utah, at Tennessee, home to USC, home to Washington. No one else is going to do that, but that's kind of what you have to do if you're BYU. The, the Novembers look a lot different than the Septembers. This year's November uh, sees a rivalry game against Utah State. That's a really good game. Uh, Liberty, Idaho State, FCS, UMass, and San Diego State, another pretty good game there as well. So this year you kind of see the imbalance between September and November. But in future years, I, I think you can look at the Novembers, and they're shaping up a little better. Uh, next year, Boise and Stanford. Uh, the year after that, uh, USC is on the November schedule. Uh, the year after that, uh, there, there's the East Carolina game again, Boise and Stanford on the schedule. So you really can find in future years uh, things looking good kind of start to finish in terms of big names and fun places to play. And that's one of the most interesting things about being an independent is all the places you can go, all the places you can see and teams you can face. Uh, it, it, it's pretty memorable uh, if you're a college football player, and the objective is to get as many of those high-profile Ws as you can, and the Wisconsin game last year is a pretty good example. Greg, as, um, you, as you went over the schedule, obviously you were just highlighting certain things, um, and, and uh, one of the things that really jumps out at me is uh, just how, despite um, the ones that you already mentioned, and you're leaving off programs um, like – at Toledo, at USF, and Boise State. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and I know you were just going down the schedule. I know you didn't intentionally lead those t- those teams off. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying that speaks to the quality of this schedule because what Toledo's done in recent years under under first Coach Campbell and now uh, Coach Candle, and then uh, USF, and then uh, obviously Boise State. Uh, you guys know them very well from uh, the Mountain West. Right. I'm just kind of comparing your Septembers and Novembers. And so, you know, yeah, obviously, you know, not to leave out the middle chunk of the schedule, BYU plays just two October games this year, uh, that game at USF and the home game with Boise. But uh, that's the danger is, is you can't you can't say, well, it's a, it's a four-game season. If we get through those four P5s, we'll be okay because that next week you're on the road to Toledo. And, and, and so, you know, I, I don't even like using the phrase or the word trap game because – uh, these teams are too good to be considered that, right? And 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 uh, so, uh, it, as, as tough a slog as it is in those first four weeks, it doesn't get much easier when you head to Toledo the very next week. And so, I really do think you find with these BYU schedules strength uh, from start to finish. And 2019 is a pretty good example of it. No doubt about it. Um, and uh, just looking at the picture, uh, looking at the big picture, excuse me. Um, What's the feeling there in Provo as you're entering year four of Kalani Sataki? Nine wins, four wins, then back up to seven. Uh, a lot of starters returning, as we've discussed this year. Um, tremendously challenging schedule, but obviously that's the expectation there in Provo. So so what's the fan base's um, take on Coach Sataki as a whole? Well, he's really a, a, a beloved figure here because uh, he's been a lifetime and lifelong BYU fan uh, before he was even a BYU player, and 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 uh, he, he's he's kind of a uh, a Lavelle Edwards disciple, if you will. He played for Lavelle, kind of stylizes himself a little bit after Lavelle, and so I think everyone wants Kalani to have success. And he's he's one game above 500, and I think the objective would be to make sure you get into next season still above 500. And I think if that's the case, BYU will be on a pretty okay path. But it's such a challenging slate as we've talked about. Uh, just getting a winning record and getting to a bowl game, I think, will be an accomplishment here in 2019. Again, keep that winning record intact, stay a winning head coach, and see how long you can take this out. He's got two more years on his contract this year and next. And so this is a really important year because BYU has rarely let coaches get into a final year without an extension. And so uh, this is the year to go earn that. And if, if, he, if he does, I think BYU will be in pretty good shape. Greg, kind of looking at things from a from a bit different angle, and this can be very challenging to gauge because you never truly know until, until the kids arrive on campus and uh, suit up on Saturdays and so forth. But uh, how does recruiting appear to be going under Coach Sataki with, with his uh, with his tremendous background with BYU, both as a, as a fan and as a, a player, coach, et cetera? Well, the, 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 those who track it uh, more intensely than I do uh, think that BYU's done decently well, kind of middle of the pack if you will, in terms of, of, of the, the, the P5s. And I think BYU kind of fashions itself as kind of a P5 program in a lot of ways, even though they're not in a P5 conference. They kind of look that way in, in, in facilities and reputation and exposure. And a lot of conferences actually include BYU in their P5 scheduling criteria when they have that quota. So 
they kind of put themselves in that same kind of mix. And I think probably, you know, middle to, 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 to maybe lower third, second third of, the, of those P5 teams in terms of the kind of players they can attract, generally speaking. But then you got to drill down a little deeper and realize that BYU is a tougher fit for a lot of kids. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a more strict environment. And, and it's, uh, and it's a very, very, very challenging academic institution. So BYU's net becomes pretty small when all is said and done. But, uh, this past year is a good example of when they get, uh, a high, a highly recruited quarterback by the name of Jacob Conover, but you're not going to see him for more than two years because he's going to head off on a church mission and, and so you hope he's the same player he is when he gets back. But that's a, that's a good example of what happens at BYU guys where you get, uh, you know, a blue chip type guy, but you really don't, have any way to gauge him because you're not going to see him for a few years and that's pretty consistent here at BYU. Certainly very excited about the um and I know you earlier you referenced how uh, of course our primary market and uh, focus is East Carolina and with East Carolina being on future BYU schedules that's something that Pirate fans are very excited about. Uh, unfortunately I was unable to make the trip out to Provo in 2015 when the Pirates and Cougars met um, but I'm very much looking forward to hopefully uh, getting out there um, when the Two programs meet again. Well, I think we've got uh, we've talked about 2022, right? That's on the schedule here in Provo, and then there's another visit uh, to Greenville in 2024, I think as well. Um, and so those games I know are on the schedule for BYU and ECU, and that that, that was a tough one. That, that 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 game at East Carolina came in the four and nine season. It was kind of a low point for BYU. They just they just didn't have it together that night in any way. Uh, ECU was very generous defensively coming into that game. And BYU didn't do what they hoped they could do against the Pirates that night. And so uh, certainly one that uh, kind of uh, was indicative of the kind of struggles BYU had in that 2017 season. But uh, more games with the uh, purple and gold on the schedule here to come. I look forward to them. Absolutely. Um, Greg, thank you so much for your time this morning. I enjoyed chatting about the Cougs with you. And so um, tell, tell our listeners where they can follow you on social media and uh, so forth. Well, yeah, I, I do a lot of tweeting, and uh, for, for fans out there who might uh, want to check in on what's happening with BYU now and again, it's uh, at Greg Rubel, just my name, at G-R-E-G. The last name is W-R-U-B-E-L-L, at Greg Rubel on, on Twitter uh, for all things BYU. And, yeah, it's been a pleasure chatting with you guys again. Uh, talk college football is coming up close, and whenever you want to hear about the Cougs, I'm here for you. Absolutely. We look forward to uh, catching up with you uh, back and back, uh, or excuse me, in the season. And um, and uh, thanks so much. And just and have an excellent summer. My pleasure. Same to you guys. Thanks. Really enjoyed him uh, very much. I'll tell you what, uh, BYU looks like. I don't think that. And I, and I was thinking that. I asked him about that, Cal, about coming into the American. They they're sitting pretty, man. They are a national brand. I don't think they're going to. I don't think they're going to come in the American and give up. And it sounds like he said the same, what I we pretty much already knew. They have their t- television contract. They love the being BYU scheduling independent, you know, and going around the country. So, uh, love BYU. That would be awesome if you could get them in the American, but I don't think that's going to happen. Maybe, a, um, not being negative now, I just don't see it happening. No, you're probably right, but I'll tell you what, to be honest with you, despite their schedule, and it is exciting and all. If they ever want a chance to play in a New Year's Six Bowl, uh, they need to probably join the American. Um, yep. And if they have some great season, they play a type of schedule as an independent. If they were able to recruit the talent, to get the coach, you could take them to a undefeated season, they would be in the playoff, which is going to be really hard to do in a group of five conference. But with the schedule they play, they would be in the playoff if they went undefeated. That's a good. I hadn't thought about. It. That's a good point because because they're independent, like we were for twenty years, like seventy seven and ninety seven, we had no choice but to play the big boys because we had nobody else. Yeah, to. but and I think you know this when aren't applying this, but going back independent for in East Carolina nowadays would be a oh would be, would be yes, no 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 yeah. no. I'm talking about at the time. Yes. I know, I know. I'm just saying, I can. We can relate to how they feel as far as being independent, having to play. Yeah, big boys. yeah. It's, the only difference is Dave, and I know every now and then we got some of the guys come here. They're getting home and home. So you know, they're, they're being. They, they want to be treated like Notre Dame is what they want, and, yeah. and I think I think of maybe over time they can get to that status, but it's going to take a while. No doubt about it. Let's. Uh, 
let's definitely uh, wish them a great season. And, uh, you know, um, that's, you know, you make a great point about with them, about the schedule and the playoff. And that's what would make the, uh, just make this point. We'll keep moving on. That's what make it would, would make it exciting for me is to see, say, a BYU, an independent. Um, there, it seems to me one of the things that I'll, I'll complain about, about the college playoff is basically you know who's going to be the national championship every single year of the last handful of years. And it's not their fault because Clemson and Alabama are – It is their fault. <laughs> head and shoulders above pretty much everybody. But at the same time, um, there there needs to be the – I think it needs to be more, but I'll take baby steps. So I'm praying for an 18 playoff. I really, I really want to see that. Um, it's probably going to be, as we were talking to Chris Fanini earlier, it's probably going to be what the – 2026 season before we see it hopefully sooner but um if it's 2026 it'll be fine at least we'll see it before <laughs> it's yeah. better than the 14 now in my opinion because i think that the i think there will be in other words what they don't want for the big boys they don't want it where an underdog ever wins it so like in east right. carolina even though we're we have a rich tradition in their eyes we're an underdog and so they don't want that but that's what I'll say this, that's what makes all these tournaments great. That's what makes a playoff great is when you don't see, you don't see that diamond in the rough. You don't see that dark horse team, that Cinderella, and all of a sudden, can you believe they won the national championship? They can make billions. But anyway, um, we're not going to solve that tonight. No. And uh, <laughs> for sure, uh, we all have to work tomorrow, and at least two out of the three. <laughs> I think Bubba, Bubba, you're going to have to work around the house, right? Say it again. You're gonna to have to work around the house. You have a honeydew list, I think. I was saying two out of three of us have to work. So, well, not a honeydew list, but yeah, there's certainly things to. Is it a cantaloupe list? No, it's a what I need to do list. Uh, so that was a melon joke. Yeah, <laughs> but no. After just getting back from the beach, there's certainly things that I need to do. And uh, no, there is no baseball game for the Lake Norman Copperheads tomorrow night. Uh, tonight, um, we had a doubleheader, two seven-inning ball games spent right at six hours at the ballpark. So uh, it will be nice to have tomorrow night off before getting back at it so when we have a home game on, on Thursday. Well, guys, uh, I tell you what, we've got um, so much going on. So many guests, so little time. Let's talk about the uh, – we, we obviously want to thank Chris Vanini um, and Greg Ravel uh, coming on for the BYU play-by-play. And, of course, Chris is uh, awesome because uh, you guys – I'm telling you, you got to check out The Athletic. It's one of my go-tos, just like Hoist the Colors. I could go on and on um, different websites I use for sports. But The Athletic has been – because since we've had him on, I have been like hooked on there almost every single day. I look at the website; it's uh, really good. But anyway, uh, Bubba, who else do we have coming up? <laughs> Bubba, Bubba. Yes, I'm here. Sorry, I, I muted the phone while I was trying to carry my sleeping seven year old into the house. Oh, uh, gotcha. But, but um, yeah, we, we have a, a ton of guests. Uh, you can check out our, our Twitter at TheSportsOBJ. So we'll, we'll be talking to the likes of John Gilbert, as we mentioned earlier, Joe Dooley, Philip Woods from the Pirate Club. Um, also, um, we'll be talking to Pirate Steve, Steve Wetzel, who's, who's been leading us through the Purple Haze for, for a decade now. We started that um, back in the the final year of the Skiff Holtz era in 2009. So enjoy catching up, Steve, here in the next few days. And then we'll also have some non-ECU guests, and we'll talk to Will Vandervoort uh, from the Clemson Insider and um, several other folks. And then, and then also, um, folks, don't forget our uh, 50 Pirates 50 Days feature. That will be kicking off on Friday, um, July the 12th, and going all the way up through August the 30th, the day before opening day. And that will get underway in a big way on Friday as we'll talk to Shane Carden. No doubt about it. And by the way, folks, uh, well, I'm very excited to tell you that coming up, uh, she's back from vacation. Should be by the time you hear this podcast. But Dana Shrink, who is with Dana, Dana's Global Travel, for our big, big, big pirate cruise next year, the Sports Objective Pirate Cruise uh, should be the end of this week. Early next week, we're going to start taking deposits for the cruise, and we'll give you uh, when we get up with Dana. We'll get her on and um, 
have an official kickoff and talk about how people get in touch with her and go ahead and start making payments on what's going to be a fantastic five-day cruise, actually four-day cruise. It's going to be the 16th through the 19th of, um, that'll be of July of 2020. We're going from Charleston to the Bahamas. Kyle, I promise it's going to have a great time. I don't know if Bubba can go. I hope you can go, Bubba. That would be tremendous. But we're going to have a, a great time, and I know we're going to have a party on there. We're going to have, uh, what else? Let's see. The party is going to be on there. The social, two-hour social plus, we're going to record a podcast on the boat, and then obviously it'll be special and put it out when we get back. Everything the sports objective does is special, no, no doubt about it. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, certainly, certainly hope that works out. Um, in, in addition to that, um, that's what that's what uh, we'll hopefully have some media day coverage, um, and that and that's something that will be announced here in the next week or few. That's great, and uh, yes, we do. And I tell you what. Uh, I don't know about you guys. I'm actually officially tired, so well, let's put Thank this you. podcast to bed. Are you tired, Kyle? Can you keep yeah, going I'm on? I'm surprised you hadn't heard me snoring. <laughs> no, not yet. I didn't hear it. Not so far. But I uh, appreciate you guys very much. Thanks to our great guest again, Chris Manini of The Athletic, and again, Greg Rebell from the play-by-play voice of BYU. Until next time, you've been listening to the Sports Objective Podcast. You've been listening to the Sports Objective Podcast. Join us next time as the guys will be objective, and the objective is sports.